working through chapter summaries for Griffiths. We're on chapter three now. This chapter has a lot in there. Um, but really there's, I think, two big ideas. Number one, uh, solving the Laplace equation, finding the potential with boundary value, with boundary values. And I'm not going to go through all the details because it's a summary. It's not the whole chapter. And the other thing is the electric potential and the electric field due to a dipole. Now that one actually is very important. Okay, so where are we? Remember we've talked about the electric field. We can calculate the electric field as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the integral of rho dv over r squared r hat. So you can integrate over all space and find the electric field. And then we can find the electric potential as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the integral of rho dv over r. And if you want to get between those two, you can, because I know that E is negative the gradient of the potential. And don't forget, Gauss's law says that the divergence of E is rho over epsilon naught. So if I put this in for that, I actually get the Laplace equation, or the Poisson equation, uh, which is the second partial of the potential is negative the, the charge density with, over divided by epsilon naught. That, how do you solve that equation? That's the first part of this thing, how do you solve that equation? And in particular, how do you solve this equation when rho is zero, no charges? So now we have this. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, in one dimension, it's pretty easy. If you have a one-dimensional space, I can, in the x direction, this is the part, second partial of v with respect to x is equal to zero. Uh, I can just integrate this twice, and you get v of x is mx plus b. It's a line. So if I take the derivative of that twice, you get zero. And then it comes down to finding m and b with your boundary, okay, your boundary conditions. So I don't know what, I need to know some v at some x twice, and those are my boundaries. And once you do that, you can find m and b. Now, what if you have a two-dimensional system? <clears throat> well, it starts getting more complicated. And I'm not going to go through all the details here, but uh, if you have a two-dimensional v of x and y, then we actually have the Laplacian is going to be the second partial of v with respect to x plus the second partial of v with respect to y is equal to zero. One way to solve this is to say, okay, what if v of x and y is x capital of x times y capital of y? Well, it turns out that you can get two differential equations, one for just x and one for just y, and you can solve it with the boundary values. Um, now, the, the best thing about this, I'm not going to go through the details, is essentially one thing that you can do to solve this is to find an infinite sum of sines and cosines that match, and it becomes like the Fourier series. And again, the details are not appropriate for a summary. I do have a video on that, and again, if you can't find that video, it's in the playlist down below, just comment. I usually am able to find those things for you, so if you need help with that. Okay. Now, the final thing is, well, what if you do this in three dimensions? In three dimensions, boom, super tough. Um, <clears throat> the book goes through these spherical harmonic solutions to uh, the three-dimensional solution. Uh, I didn't do that in my class just because it just bogged down in the math too much. I want to stick with the big ideas. What I did do, and I think is important, is to take the two-dimensional Laplacian and solve it with a finite element analysis. So basically break it into finite elements and then use those values to uh, adjust themselves and find a solution. And that comes down to the uni uniqueness theorem. Can, I don't know if I can spell this. Unique. Yes, I might have misspelled that. This says that if you find a function that matches the boundary conditions, then it's the function. Right? So if I find, if I just guessed v of x and y, that match the boundary conditions, then I'm done, right? It has to be the solution. So if you have it matching the boundary conditions, you won. That's the uniqueness theorem. It comes up again later, so that's why I'm talking about it. Um, okay, another way to solve problems, these boundary value problems, is the method of images. It's really just a, it is a trick. So imagine I have a metal, and I put a charge right here. Well, what can I do? Well, it turns out that the boundary condition here uh, is that the potential uh, on the boundary is zero. 
And so I don't care about a solution inside the metal. I just care about a solution over here. And if I want to guess a solution where the boundary works, I can put a, a negative charge right there and of equal charge, equal distance, and that will make the potential zero right along that boundary. Boom, it works. So this is the method of images. Okay, you basically put an image charge back here. Now we can also find expressions for the charge density. Um, I guess, what did I write that down? I forgot what it was. The charge density sigma is ne negative epsilon naught, the partial of V with respect to N. So N is a unit, the, the direction of the surface. Okay, that's that. Now, be very careful. What if I want to use method of images for a sphere? So here I have a metal sphere. So that's all metal. And I put a positive charge right there, Q. Here, Q, S, negative Q, S. It looks just like a mirror. But right here, there, I can find a charge and I can put it inside here such that the potential over here is zero. I can do that, but it's not going to have the same charge and it's not going to be the same distance. It's not trivial. It's not impossible, but it's not trivial. But that, that does work. And any situation like that where you have, if you can pick a charge that gives you the right potential on the surface, which would be zero, you're good to go. That's the method of images. Okay, finally, we have, I think, an important thing. So one of the things, uh, they do this multipole expansion of, of uh, electric potential. Um, basically, it says that any charge distribution can be written as a net charge plus a dipole moment plus a quadrupole moment. Um, the net charge is fine. All we're going to focus on is the dipole moment. So imagine that I have uh, a positive and a negative charge, Q, separated by a distance S. Well, the net charge is zero but there is still an electric potential around there and there's also an electric field. And so we can represent this as a dipole moment. So you can calculate the dipole moment P as the integral over all the charges R rho dV. And so it's a vector. It's, if you just have two charges, this would be P. And from that, I can calculate, uh, once I know the dipole moment, I can calculate the electric potential everywhere. So I wrote this down because sometimes I forget this. I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to remember. Uh, so the potential is uh, V of R, and that's a vector of R, uh, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught P dot R hat over R squared. And then I can find the electric field. So this is nice because it's a scalar. It's easy, easier to derive this using the scalar electric potential. Um, then you can take the derivative, the gradient, to find the electric potential. And you should do it in spherical coordinates uh, to find it spherically. And if you do that, you get the electric field. Again, I have to write this down. P, that's the magnitude, over 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed. And then I have 2 cosine theta r hat plus sine theta phi hat. So that's in spherical coordinates. So that's the r hat is that way. Um, phi hat is into and out of the border, right? Because that's the angle theta from the z-axis. I And that's a, that's a nice thing to derive. I like this version better. E is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 3 p dot r hat times r hat minus p, all of that over r cubed. Because this doesn't really care what coordinate system you use. This is really great numerically. If you want to numerically find the electric field due to a dipole, that's the electric field. And why, why do we care about dipoles? Uh, well, once we start modeling matter, the dipole matters a lot. Because we can model uh, the uh, effect of electric field on matter as inducing tiny little dipoles. So that's that. Two things. Remember, solving the Laplace equation, uh, dipoles. And dipoles will come back because we have magnetic dipoles. So just letting you know. Hope that helps. Talk to you later.